You are listening to Echoes of Icarus, an interstellar dilemma. An original story from Conlon Publishing. Chapter 1. A World Left Behind. The year is 2100. Earth, ravaged by environmental disasters and political unrest, had become a battleground. Mobs, empowered by decades of lawlessness, rule through violence and fear. Earth's latest and final interstellar starship, the Icarus, awaits as humanity's last hope of survival, a colossal vessel carrying a carefully chosen colony in cryogenic sleep, destined for a new beginning on an uninhabited planet called Terra Nova II. On the launch pad, bathed in the harsh sunlight, a line of hopeful colonists awaited their turn to board the shuttle ship that will take them to the Icarus, currently stationed where Earth's thin blue line meets the vast, unfathomable void of cosmic obscurity. Scorched Earth stretched out beyond the fenced-in area, as far as the eye could see, a stark reminder of the damaged world they were leaving behind. Caesar, a young man with a smile that could melt butter, strums a gentle melody on his instrument. His ancestral music, a gift from his late father, soothed his nerves and eases the rising tension around him. As the final note fades, leaving a peaceful hush in its wake, a young woman with eyes as bright as the departing sunlight turned to Caesar, her hair wallowing with the wind. That was something else, she said with a smile. It felt like I was back in Mexico for a few moments. Such talent, you obviously didn't have to pay for your ticket. Caesar was not prepared for such a compliment, his olive skin now a bashful red as Alice turned back around to wait her turn. As the line moved forward slowly towards the shuttle ship, Caesar and Alice exited the gangway and were directed to their assigned seats. They passed a burly man, Liam, whose face showed the clear signs of frustration, appearing to argue heatedly with a senior Icarus officer. Unlike Liam's worn colonist garb, the officer was impeccably dressed in the crisp blue uniform of the starship. Liam, having grown up under the iron fist of the mobs, craved a new life on the Icarus, a chance for redemption after a lifetime of failures. Now, his impatience threatened to jeopardize their departure. Hold your ground, citizen. Boomed the officer with military precision. Take your assigned seat. If you're worried about the mobs interrupting our departure, I suggest you stop causing delays. He gestured towards the seating area with a firm hand. A sense of unease settled in Alice's stomach as they shuffled through the shuttle. Glancing back at the commotion, she couldn't resist a playful nudge towards Caesar. Looks like someone's overdue a good nap, huh? Caesar let out a timid giggle, the tension in his shoulders easing. Liam, catching the tail end of Alice's remark, shot them a fleeting glare. Heeding the officer's stern command, he mumbled something inaudible and finally took his assigned seat, the urgency momentarily quelled as the shuttle doors closed. As the cramped shuttle blasted through Earth's atmosphere and docked with the Icarus, the passengers disembarked, the contrast of the flimsy craft that brought them from Earth was stark. Here, aboard the robust Icarus, amidst the sterile corridors and whirring machinery, a sense of safety finally settled over everyone. After a brief orientation on ship protocols and emergency procedures, they found themselves ushered into the cryopod room. A vast, dimly lit space hummed with a soft whirring of technology. Rows upon rows of gleaming cryogenic pods lined the walls, each one an individual vessel for their 300-year slumber. By a twist of fate, or, perhaps the ship's efficient algorithm, Caesar, Alice, and Liam found themselves nestled together in adjacent pods. Caesar, grinning from ear to ear, couldn't hide his delight at the sheer serendipity of having Alice's pod next to his. Alice, ever focused, nodded obediently while the technicians briefed them on the final steps before cryosleep. Liam, still brooding over Alice's earlier jibe, again muttered something inaudible and followed suit. With a steady buzz, the temperature within the pods began to plummet. As the reality of their 300-year slumber settled in, the unmistakable notes of Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries swelled from unseen speakers, a powerful yet unsettling melody chosen by the ship's psychologists to maintain neural activity during the long voyage.
The technicians, their job now complete, exited the chamber for their separate crew and officer cryopod room, leaving the three companions, and the rest of the colonist, in their frozen state. The Icarus, now a solitary vessel amidst the vast canvas of space, picks up speed and started hurtling, towards the distant promise of Terra Nova 2. Chapter 2. Echoes of their past. Caesar's humble beginnings. With the stifling Guadalajara heat pressing down on the roof of Caesar's workshop, a familiar embrace even through the worn cotton of his stained mechanics shirt. Sweat beaded on his olive skin as he tightened a lug nut, the rhythmic click of his wrench a comforting counterpoint to the symphony of cicadas chirping outside. Grease smudged his hands, a badge of honor in this haven of warring gears and sparking wires. A twinge of longing tugged at Caesar's heart. A fond memory flickered to life, a young Caesar, no taller than a toolbox, perched on a stool beside his father. The clangs of a hammer echoed through the workshop his father had owned before him, a familiar soundtrack to his childhood. His father, a gentle giant, paused. A smile softened his weathered face as he caught Caesar's gaze. Take a break mijo, his father rumbled, his voice warm and rich with a Mexican lilt. He gestured to the worn guitar case leaning against the wall. Let's see if those little fingers of yours can learn a good tune. Caesar's eyes lit up, a grin splitting his face. He scrambled off the stool, the promise of music, far more enticing than watching another spark plug change. He retrieved his father's guitar, its wood smooth and worn from years of love. Caesar settled on his lap, the scent of his cologne a comforting mix of leather and wood polish. With infinite patience, his father's calloused fingers guided Caesar's smaller ones onto the strings. The simple melody, a traditional Mexican folk song, filled the workshop, a testament to their bond. In that special moment, everything froze, etching a vital memory into his heart. It would be his guiding light during tough times. No more than a few years later his father, weakened by illness, lay propped up against pillows, his usually vibrant eyes dimmed. The worn guitar case seemed out of place on the hospital bedside table. The sterile scent of disinfectant replaced the familiar workshop aroma. His father, sensing his gaze, reached out a frail hand, his touch cool against Caesar's skin. Miho, he rasped, his voice a mere whisper. Take care of her, he said, as he gestured towards the guitar case. The music. It lives on in you. A lump formed in Caesar's throat, his vision blurring. He gripped his father's hand tightly, a silent promise echoing in the sterile room of his father's deathbed. He would carry the melody forward as a testament to their bond, a defiance against the silence of loss. Despite his natural brilliance and insatiable curiosity, Caesar's path hadn't been paved in gold. He'd clawed his way out of poverty, his exceptional mechanical aptitude earning him a coveted apprenticeship at a young age. His nights, however, were spent devouring books in his tiny apartment, a relentless pursuit of knowledge that led him to fluency in five languages, Spanish, his native tongue, English, French, Portuguese, and even a smattering of Mandarin, a skill that would come in handy when applying for the Icarus's ticket lottery for desired colonists. Despite his professional successes, the accolades, and the international acclaim for his innovative engine designs, there were moments when the weight of the world felt heavy. Loneliness, a constant companion in his relentless pursuit of excellence, nodded him. In those moments, his fingers would instinctively reach for the worn guitar case, coaxing out the soothing tune his father had once taught him. The music, a lament for a lost world and a beloved father,
calmed the storm within, reminding him of love, resilience, and the legacy he carried with him. The melody, a whisper from his past, urged him forward, a testament to his father's words. Miho, nunca te rindas. Siempre lucha por aquello que amas. My son, never give up. Always fight for what you love. Wherever Caesar found himself in life, his father's guitar was always close by. The whine of a malfunctioning engine jolted him back to the present. Stepping back from his work, Caesar squared his shoulders. The Icarus, a beacon of hope in a dying world, offered a chance to rebuild, to create a future where his father's legacy and his own skills wouldn't be lost. He, Caesar, the hyper-intelligent mechanic with a heart full of music and a head brimming with knowledge, would be part of the solution. He would fight for a future worthy of the melody that resonated within his soul, a future where his talents would be valued beyond measure. Liam's Unfulfilling Life As Liam crumpled yet another rejection letter from NASA, the catastrophic Florida heat pressed down, thick and suffocating, mirroring the weight in his chest. His dreams of following in his grandfather's footsteps, the legendary astronaut John Skywalker O'Malley, the first human to step foot on Mars, seemed perpetually out of reach. The psych evals always tripped him up. Too impulsive, the report stated, not a team player. Sitting at his kitchen table, a crumpled betting slip fluttered to the floor, a stark reminder of his latest failed attempt to chase a shortcut. It all started with a desperate gamble, a chance to buy a ticket on Terra Nova 1, the first colony planet. Honest work just wasn't enough. The glittering promise of a new life on another world had him chasing long odds at casinos run by the mob. At his lowest point he narrowly escaped a serious altercation with his legs intact, the memory a constant reminder of his foolishness. Almost collapsing on the kitchen table from the weight of an empty bottle of rum, surrounded by scatterings of unwashed dishes and half-finished sketches of Martian landscapes. Art was his only escape, a private mental space where his imagination could soar beyond the limitations the real world seemed determined to place on him. He yearned to prove himself, not just to the faceless bureaucrats at NASA, but to the ghost of his grandfather who loomed large in his memory. Like the time when his mother held him tight as her father, Liam's grandfather, returned to Earth to great applause and fanfare. He could never forget the pride he saw on her face that day. As much as he tried, however, he would never see that same beaming smile on her again. Yet, despite his fiery temper and tendency to push people away, Liam possessed a hidden strength. He could fix anything with a roll of duct tape and a screwdriver, and his resourcefulness had earned him the respect of his blue-collar crew at the shipyard that built the Icarus. Maybe, just maybe, there was a place for him out there among the stars, even if it wasn't piloting the spaceship he helped build with his own two hands, a feat overshadowed by the constant sting of rejection. Maybe there was another way. A way that wouldn't involve waiting for NASA's approval or the crushing weight of debt constantly hanging over his head. A recent turn of events, a twist of fate some might say, had presented him with an unexpected opportunity. The passing of his mother was a bittersweet moment. On one hand she died without seeing him achieve anything to be proud of. On the other hand she had left him his grandfather's fortune. Guilt or shame wasn't an emotion that lingered long with Liam, so seeing a flicker of hope in his mother's death was very on brand for him. This was his opportunity, a chance to escape the dead-end cycle he felt trapped in. He could finally clear his name with the mob and secure a coveted spot on the Icarus as a premium colonist. But the question gnawed at him, what lengths of deception and trickery would he have to go to in order to pass the notoriously difficult Icarus psych test? Maybe. Just maybe, this was his chance to forge a new path, a path worthy of the man, who first instilled in him a love for the stars. Alice. A simple country girl. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the dusty playground of the school, where Alice worked as a teacher. Laughter, once a constant soundtrack to her days, now echoed faintly from only a small handful of children, ten to be exact. That's all that remained of her once vibrant class. Dust storms, a relentless consequence of the dying earth, 
had driven families away, leaving behind a hollow ache in Alice's heart. Inside the dilapidated schoolhouse, she knelt beside a small girl named Maya, her brow furrowed in concentration over a dried-out pumpkin seed. Alice wondered how it could be possible that this child didn't even know what a seed was. Maya, she said, her voice as warm as ever. Even in the harshest places, there's always a spark of life waiting to bloom. All it needs is a little care. Maya's eyes, wide and haunted by stories her young mind shouldn't know, locked on Alice's face. A hesitant smile tugged at the corner of her lips. Together, they carefully planted the seed in a chipped clay pot, while Alice hummed a forgotten song from her childhood. Suddenly, a gust of wind rattled the windows, whipping dust devils across the barren fields. Maya whimpered, clutching her teacher's hand. Miss, will it ever stop? She whispered, her voice barely a tremor. Alice's heart ached. Here, in the eyes of this innocent child, reflected the despair that had become a constant companion. No child should live without hope, she thought fiercely. A spark ignited within her, a desperate yearning to shield these fragile souls. Rising to her feet, she met Maya's gaze. Maybe not, she told Maya, her voice surprisingly steady. But that doesn't mean we can't find something new. A place where the sun still shines and the rain still pours, and flowers still bloom without fear of the dust. Now, pulling out a crumpled brochure from her pocket, to show the small class. On its cover, a vibrant blue and green planet gleamed amidst a star-studded sky. This, she announced, a hopeful smile blooming on her face, is Terra Nova 2. A new beginning, maybe even a chance to heal the Earth we know. Alice saw a flicker of something new ignite in Maya's eyes, a spark of curiosity replacing the fear. As Alice explained the wonders of this distant world, the classroom, for a brief moment, felt filled with the promise of a future, far brighter than the one outside. Alice was unsure if she was trying to inspire the children or sell the idea to herself. Either way she knew if she wanted to see hope in the eyes of children again, she needed to go to Terra Nova too. Chapter 3. A Rude Awakening. By this point in our story, seven years have vanished into the abyss of time. The steady hum of the cryogenic chamber, a constant companion for the colonists' slumber, continued. A single pod, Caesar's, spluttered back to life with a hiss of escaping coolant. Disoriented and blinking away the remnants of dreams, he found himself staring at the stark white ceiling. Panic clawed at his throat as a red warning light pulsed ominously above him. The soothing pre-sleep melody, designed to ease them into cryostasis, was replaced by a chilling electronic drone. Caesar fumbled with the manual release lever, his hands slick with cold sweat. As the pod hissed open, revealing the cramped interior, he was greeted by the sight of Alice's vacant pod next to his. Alice? His voice echoed in the sterile chamber, a hollow sound swallowed by the silence. Just then, a muffled groan came from the adjoining pod. Relief washed over Caesar as he saw Liam's pod creak open as well, revealing a bleary-eyed and equally confused figure. What kind of fresh hell is this? Liam muttered with a hoarse voice. Is this some kind of drill? Caesar shook his head, dread settling in his stomach. Not a drill amigo. Something's wrong. He pointed at the malfunctioning warning light on his own pod. A glance at the adjacent pods revealed the same ominous glow emanating from Alice's and Liam's. The other pods, as far as their limited view allowed, remained stubbornly dark and silent. Suddenly, a disembodied voice crackled through the intercom. It was the ship's AI, its usual calm tone, felt disjointed with the message it was delivering. Attention pods 7B, 8C, and 9D. A critical system failure has been detected within your cryogenic unit. Life support remains functional, but medical attention is strongly advised. Please proceed immediately to the medical bay on deck 7.
The message looped over and over, a stark reminder of their predicament. 7b, 8c, and 9d, Caesar repeated thoughtfully, tracing the pod numbers with his finger. Those correspond to the same power circuit board, right? Alice, who had regained some of her composure, nodded slowly. And maybe even the same processor bank. Is that why only our pods woke up? Liam, still grappling with the situation, mumbled, glitch in the system? It must be. Following the AI's instructions, they made their way to the medical bay. After a battery of tests and scans, the ship's automated medical droid declared them healthy. The early awakening caused no lasting physiological damage. Alice, ever the analytical thinker, asked the ship's AI when they would arrive at Terra Nova 2. Estimated time of arrival at designated coordinates, 293 Earth years. A stunned silence again descended upon the trio. The math was undeniable. Only seven years had passed, not the anticipated three centuries. Their hopes and dreams, carefully constructed inside their minds for the long journey, shattered in an instant. Panic threatened to bubble up again, but Caesar forced it down. They needed to act rationally. Heading back to the cryo chamber, they worked together frantically scanning the pod's emergency manual. Troubleshooting steps were a desperate attempt to coax their pods back into hibernation. Days bled into one another, punctuated only by the rhythmic hum of the ship and the gnawing frustration of their failed efforts. Liam, the ever-volatile one, started showing signs of strain as he paced in circles. The dream of a new beginning, a chance at redemption from a lifetime of failure, seemed to slip further away from him with each passing hour. One evening, during a meager meal scavenged from the ship's galley, the doomed trio came to terms with their fate. Their options were few and far between, but they discussed them together nonetheless. As had now become routine, they separated for the evening and settled down into private officer cabins to sleep. A glint of manic determination flickered in Liam's eyes. If I can't reach Terra Nova too, he snarled to himself, his voice laced with a desperate edge, then, no one will. While Caesar and Alice wrestled with much-needed sleep, Liam embarked on his own secret mission, fueled by a twisted sense of revenge. He slipped undetected into the ship's control room, like a ghost in the sterile corridors. There, with a single-minded focus, he began to tamper with the navigation system. His rage burned white-hot as he plotted a new navigation course, a suicidal trajectory that would send the Icarus plummeting straight into the heart of the nearest star. Although Caesar and Alice remained unaware of what he had done, he bypassed the ship's security anyway and encrypted the navigation panel with a complex 75-digit password that no one, other than he would know. This way, even if they did find out what he'd done, they couldn't change their destiny. As the Icarus hurtled towards the nearest star, it passed through an asteroid field, small pockets of ding noises, quickly turned into loud thumps and bangs. All of a sudden, the alarm was raised again. What now, thought Caesar. The ship's AI returned to the intercom. Emergency. Emergency. The ship's hull has been breached on deck 13, zone 5. Oxygen supply is being depleted at a rapid pace. Yet again, the ship's AI kept repeating the same message as Caesar, Alice and Liam ran to the control room. They showed us how to remotely seal off areas during our orientation briefing. If we close the airtight doors around the hole, we might just be okay. Alice could hear the panic in Caesar's voice as he shouted this during their dash to the control room. Liam, also panicking, thought, this isn't what I intended, but the outcome will be the same anyway. I'll just play along with it. They can't find out I changed the ship's navigation course. Caesar's plan worked. Closing the airtight doors around the breached hull had stopped any more oxygen escaping. The ship's AI confirmed over the PA system with a new message. Oxygen levels stabilizing, irreparable damage to the colony's vital supplies dock. 
Alice knew any hope of finding the tools they needed to fix their pods were in that storage area on Deck 13. Now, their fate was definitely sealed. Making it to Terra Nova 2 had become utterly impossible. But how did the ship fly directly into an asteroid field? Surely the Icarus officers would have planned the voyage around this? She returned to the ship's control room to investigate her suspicions and discovered the grim reality that somebody on board had changed the ship's navigation course. It wasn't her, and none of the other cryopods were damaged, so it could only have been Caesar or Liam. But who would do such a thing? Did they both commit this crime together, or had one of them gone rogue? She decided the best course of action was to confront them. Time was running out faster than the ship's oxygen. She had to do it immediately. The three of them sat around a table facing each other as Alice explained what she knew. Both were stunned into silence. Caesar in particular was unable to comprehend her news, while Liam began to show signs of defensiveness and aggression, like she'd seen before at the gangway of the shuttle ship. As time was of the essence, Alice quietly analyzed the responses of Caesar and Liam. Liam was attempting to shift the blame onto Caesar, accusing him in a voice laced with desperation. Caesar just kept saying, but why? Following her gut instinct, she accused Liam of changing the ship's course and setting a new, impossible password on the navigation system. Without the password, we have no hope, she exclaimed. Within seconds, a look of manic determination flickered in Liam's eyes. Caesar reacted instinctively, tackling him to the ground. Give us the password, you coward. Caesar roared, his voice raging with pure anger. Liam was physically stronger than Caesar, but Caesar managed to pin him down. Quick, Alice. Tie his hands behind his back, he's out of control. Alice, shaken but ever determined, grabbed a length of cable from around a nearby monitor, and following Caesar's frantic orders, she bound Liam's wrists tightly. This swift and decisive action confirmed her suspicions. Caesar wouldn't be acting like this if he were guilty. Now, with Liam restrained, they had to get the password out of him. But how? Caesar's chest heaved with exertion. Sweat dripping from his forehead, in stark contrast to the sterile environment of the control room. Liam, pinned beneath him, writhed and wriggled in frustration, his face contorted with rage. You'll never get it out of me, he snarled, accidentally admitting his guilt with a choked voice mixed with anger and fear. The gravity of the situation hung heavy in the air. Their only hope for survival, a 75-digit password locked away in the traitor's mind. We have to try, Alice said, her voice surprisingly steady. Without it, we're all dead. Caesar gritted his teeth. Talk, Liam. What the hell were you thinking? Silence stretched between them. Liam's eyes darted around the room, searching for an escape, a weapon, anything. A slow, chilling smile spread across his face. You wouldn't understand, he rasped. Desperation clawed at Caesar. Maybe not. But we can still try to fix this. Just give us the damn password or everyone on board will die. Liam's gaze locked with Alice's, a flicker of something almost human passing through his manic glint. There's no fixing this, he said, his voice barely a whisper. His words sent a shiver down Alice's spine. A horrifying realization dawned on her. The password might not be the only obstacle they faced today. Chapter 4. A Desperate Bargain the air crackled with a tension thicker than the stale recycled oxygen. Caesar paced the sterile confines of the control room like a caged lion, a growl rumbling in his chest. He slammed his fist on the table, where a restrained Liam now sat, the metallic clang echoing in the confined space. One hour. Caesar roared, his voice raw with urgency. That's all the time we have before that huge ball of fire turns us all into cosmic dust. The lives of everyone on board, humanity's survival itself, literally rests on you giving us this goddamn password, spit it out now. Liam flinched under Caesar's tirade, his face a mask of despair. Alice, ever the pragmatist, knew a different approach was needed. She placed a calming hand on Caesar's arm, her
her gaze fixed on Liam. Caesar, she said firmly, please, let me handle this. Caesar's glare lingered, fixated on Liam for a moment longer before stepping back, his chest heaving with barely contained anger. Alice turned to Liam, her voice cool and measured. Liam, she began, we understand you're scared. We all are. But right now, fear is a luxury we can't afford. We're running out of time, but there's something else bothering you. It's more than just fear, isn't it? A flicker of surprise crossed Liam's face. He hadn't expected her to pick up on his underlying anxiety. He mumbled a non-committal response. Liam flinched as memories flashed before his eyes. Years of grueling training, a body honed to peak physical condition, all for nothing. He'd failed the NASA entry exams not once, not twice, but multiple times. The rejection stung even more because despite his appearance, a mountain of a man with bulging muscles, he lacked the specific psychological markers they were looking for. I... I worked so hard, he admitted, his voice thick with shame. Alice pressed on. Liam, honey. I can tell you're going through every emotion possible right now. How did you pass the Icarus psych test? Something akin to defiance crossed Liam's face for a fleeting moment. Then, his shoulders slumped in defeat. He knew they wouldn't stop until they had answers. I cheated, he confessed, his voice barely a whisper. The words hung heavy in the air, his dirty secret finally revealed. Disbelief washed over Caesar. Cheated. You cheated on a psych exam? That's insane. He boomed, his voice echoing in the small room. Liam nodded, shame etched on his face. The tests. I... I had some help, he mumbled, his voice barely a whisper. He exhaled a sigh, the weight of his actions a crushing burden. Alice's gaze narrowed. Help? What kind of help? Liam hesitated, then blurted out, I... I paid someone. On Earth. Not someone official, you understand. More like, some guys. A cold dread settled in Alice's stomach. This was worse than she imagined. Caesar scoffed, the mom. You cheated on a psych test, you put everyone on Terra Nova 2 in danger, and here we are, in danger, and no one has even stepped foot on Terra Nova 2 yet, you fool. Liam held his ground. Look, he said, his voice rising in desperation. I didn't even know if I was getting scammed or not, but it was worth a shot. There was no hope for me on Earth, nothing but dead-end jobs and a life of disappointment, and failure, and more disappointment. This mission, this chance to be a part of something bigger, it was all I had. There was no other way, no other choice, I had to do it. Alice watched the raw emotion play out on Liam's face. A part of her understood his desperation, but betraying the mission and putting everyone at risk was unforgivable. There had to be another way, she said gently but firmly. We all face challenges in life, but we don't jeopardize the lives of others because of them. Liam slumped back in his chair, defeated. The weight of his actions and the shattered dream pressed down on him. He knew he had no defense, no justification for his actions. The silence stretched, heavy with despair and simmering anger. Finally, Alice broke it. We need the password, Liam, she said, her voice steady. It's our only chance to save the ship. Liam closed his eyes, his face pale, his lips silent. Shame battled with a flicker of defiance. Seconds felt like hours, minutes bled into an agonizing eternity. Just as Alice began to think her approach had failed, she had an idea. Liam, Alice said gently, her voice laced with empathy. We understand why you did what you did. The dream of being part of something bigger, of making a difference. She paused, letting her words sink in. There's still a way for you to do that, she continued, his eyebrows raised as their eyes locked, Liam's curiosity was piqued. We can't change the past, but we can change the narrative. Give me the password, and together, we can ensure everyone on board gets to Terra Nova too. Hope finally sparked in Liam's eyes, a spark Alice desperately tried to fan. 
What do you mean? He croaked, his voice barely audible. We can write whatever we want in the ship's log entry, who's going to stop us? Alice explained, no one needs to know what you did. We can say that all three of us, you, Caesar, and I, worked tirelessly to save the ship from certain disaster after flying through the asteroid field. We can paint you as a hero, someone who faced his demons and saved the day. It's the ultimate redemption you've always craved. Silence hung heavy in the air. This was a gamble, a promise Alice couldn't guarantee the future colonists would believe. But it was all she had to offer, a chance for Liam to redeem himself, not in the eyes of others, but more importantly in his own heart. A long, agonizing moment passed. Then, a single tear rolled down Liam's cheek. He looked at Alice, a glimmer of acceptance replacing the despair. You, you do that for me? She met his gaze with unwavering sincerity. We're all in this together, and together, we can make this a story of courage, not failure. I may have left everything I own back on Earth, but I still have my word. I promise this secret will die with us, but we have to save everyone else on board first. With a shaky breath, Liam nodded, the weight of his decision settling on him. He knew he wouldn't be a celebrated hero, but at least he wouldn't be remembered as a villain. He had a chance to leave a legacy, a twisted one perhaps, but a legacy nonetheless. All right, he mumbled, his voice barely above a whisper. The password. It's the serial number on the back of the navigation control unit, his voice barely a whisper. Disbelief washed over Alice. The answer had been staring them in their face all along. She rushed to the control unit, her fingers trembling as she located the faded serial number. With a pounding heart, she began typing, the once distant star getting closer by the second, time was truly running out. Less than 15 minutes before we enter the star's orbit, Caesar boomed from across the room. You can do it Alice, keep your fingers steady. But her hands wouldn't cooperate. Each keystroke felt like a monumental effort, and with a sickening jolt, the screen flashed red. Access denied. A choked sob escaped Alice's lips. Despair threatened to engulf her. Sensing her distress, Caesar crossed the room with surprising grace for such a large man. He stopped beside her, his presence a silent reassurance. She noticed a bead of sweat trickling down his temple, the musky scent of his cologne filling her senses. In that moment, under the crushing pressure of the situation, she saw him not as a hothead, but as a pillar of strength, the last man standing. Here, he said gently, his voice surprisingly calm. Let me. Before Alice could protest, Caesar placed a large, warm hand over hers. The physical contact sent a shudder down her spine, a spark of something unexpected amidst the chaos. His touch was surprisingly steady, his focus unwavering as he began to type. The digits flew across the screen with precision and ease. Alice watched, mesmerized, as Caesar entered the seemingly endless string of characters, 75 in all. With a final tap, he leaned back. The screen flickered, then burst to life with a bright green message. This time it read, access granted. Caesar told the ship's AI to plot a course to Terra Nova 2 immediately. Recalculating route to Terra Nova 2, estimated time of arrival, 293 Earth years. Relief washed over Alice like a tidal wave. They had done it. They were saved. She and Caesar shared a look, a silent understanding passing between them. In the elation of the moment, Caesar leaned in and captured Alice's lips with a kiss. It was unexpected, fueled by adrenaline of their shared victory. Alice surrendered to the kiss, her mind a glorious blur. As they pulled apart, breathless and exhilarated, a horrifying realization dawned on them. The chair where Liam had been sitting was empty. Liam! Alice screamed, her euphoria shattered. She spun around, frantically searching the confines of the control room, but Liam was gone. Caesar swore under his breath. He better not be doing something stupid again. The relief, the celebration, it all dissolved into an icy dread. They had saved the ship, but at what cost? 
The sight of the empty chair was a chilling reminder of the consequences of Liam's actions and the desperate gamble he had taken. A new hum filled the room as the ship's engines kicked in, signaling the course correction. The once terrifying inferno outside the viewport began to recede, its scorching heat replaced by a more bearable warmth. A sliver of hope sparked within Alice. They were alive. They were safe. For now. It didn't take long for the weight of the situation to settle on them both. A heavy silence punctuated only by her ragged breaths hung in the air. They had a new problem, a new mystery to solve. Where had Liam gone? Alice and Caesar locked eyes. His face, etched with concern, mirrored her own turmoil. But amidst the fear and uncertainty, she could see something else in his eyes, a steely resolve. He wasn't alone in this and neither was she. Chapter 5. A Glimmer of Hope. A Dwindling Future. Our story continues, as if, suddenly woken from a nightmare. Again red lights strobed in the control room, casting an ominous glow on Alice and Caesar's faces. The ship's AI blared, its synthetic voice declaring. Hull breach on deck 13, zone 5. Oxygen levels depleting at an unsustainable level. Alice's heart lurched. Deck 13, zone 5? That was the storage area they'd lost in the asteroid field earlier, the one containing all the critical components they desperately needed to repair the cryogenic pods. It can't be. She gasped, dread creeping into her voice. That section was sealed after the asteroid field damage. Caesar, you sealed it, didn't you? Caesar sprang into action, his jaw clenched. Seal it again, he barked at the ship's AI. But this time, the confirmation never came. A tense silence hung heavy in the air, broken only by the continuous emergency klaxon. What the? Caesar swore, his frustration evident. He tried again, his voice laced with urgency. Seal deck 13, zone 5 immediately. Still nothing. Dread overcame them, why wasn't it working? The door must be jammed, Caesar muttered, his face grim. He knew what they had to do. Glancing at Alice, he said, we need to get down there and manually close the airlock. Her breath hitched. But the vacuum. There's no choice. Let's grab the emergency suits and we'll be fine. Trust me, Caesar interrupted, his voice leaving no room for argument. Every second counted. They worked swiftly, pulling on their bulky emergency suits, the air canisters hissing as they pressurized with oxygen. Caesar tethered himself to a secure anchor point near the breached hull, the lifeline, a stark reminder of the danger they were about to face. Alice instinctively copied him. All right, Alice, he said, his voice muffled by the helmet. Ready, whenever you are. Alice, her heart visibly pounding in her chest, secured the other end of the tether to her suit, just like Caesar was doing. Taking a deep breath, she nodded to confirm her readiness. With determination, they made their way closer towards the damaged section. The vacuum was intense, like nothing they had ever experienced before. The flickering emergency lights cast long, distorted shadows on the bulkheads, adding to the oppressive atmosphere. Finally, they reached the airlock door leading to Deck 13, Zone 5. It was slightly ajar, just as they had feared. See? Caesar screamed, pointing at the jammed door. We need to force it shut. Working together, they strained against the heavy door, their muscles screaming in protest. Slowly, inch by agonizing inch, the door began to yield. Sweat was beating on their foreheads despite the cool air circulating within their suits. Finally, with a reassuring clunk, the door slammed shut. Caesar, his chest heaving, took a moment to catch his breath. Alice monitored the oxygen levels on his suit, her own anxiety slowly giving way to a sliver of relief, they had done it. As they began their slow trek back to the control room, a glint of metal caught Alice's eye. Bending down near the airlock, she picked up a familiar object, 
a beautiful leather watch, scratched and scuffed but undeniably Liam's. She'd noticed him wearing it while tying him up earlier. The inscription on the back sent another, more sinister shiver down her spine. Liam, reach for the stars. Love, Grandad. Dread coiled in her stomach. This was Liam's watch, a cherished memento he always wore. What had happened? Had he? Well, evidently, it looks like he reached for the stars, joked Caesar. He knew instantly it was the wrong time for his dark humor. She looked at Caesar, their eyes meeting in a silent exchange of understanding. He jumped. Caesar confirmed in a second, more solemn attempt to make sense of the situation. His voice laced with a mixture of anger and grief. But why? Her voice barely audible. The answer was obvious. Liam, burdened by guilt and a desperate need to redeem himself, had made a final, fatal choice. He'd sacrificed himself, venting himself into the cold embrace of space. How could he spend the remainder of his life with only two people, who both knew his sordid secret? He knew he was, and would always be seen as a danger to the mission. Alice, Caesar and the colonists would be safer without him. Alice clasped Liam's watch close to her heart as Caesar extended his arm around her shoulder. A distractingly warm embrace comforted her as they slowly continued their return to the control room, for a reason they hadn't thought of yet. Relief washed over Alice, albeit temporary. The bigger problem remained. As she gazed at Liam's watch, all she could think of was the relentless tick-tock of time. We're stuck, she said, her voice heavy with despair. No repairs for the cryopods, 293 years of travel. It's a death sentence. Caesar slammed his fist against the wall, a growl rumbling in his chest. Damn it all. There has to be another way. But even his bravado couldn't mask the bleak truth. Hope, once a flickering ember, had been extinguished. A wave of nausea washed over Alice. Her moist red eyes, blurring the already dim lights of the control room. Caesar, his face etched with a grim resolve, comforted her. We'll find a way, his voice gruff but determined. We have to. For Liam, for ourselves and for everyone on board. His words offered a sliver of hope, a fragile ember amidst the ashes of despair. They'd lost a colonist, and their only chance at reaching Terra Nova too seemed bleak, but they were still alive. And as long as they were alive, there was a chance. Alice was a woman of conviction, she grabbed the ship's log and began frantically writing a fictional story of Liam's heroic death. Saving the ship after an accident flying through an asteroid field, that had damaged their pods and woken the trio from cryostasis, only seven years into a 300-year voyage. It wasn't much, but she promised Liam she would do it. Caesar knew to stay silent, this was her way of processing the traumatic events that had just unfurled. As she completed her task, Liam's story was written as a martyr. The future people of Terra Nova too would only ever know that their lives were saved because he sacrificed his own, to seal off the airtight doors. They would never know the truth. As she gently lay her pen down, she closed the book and rested it out of sight and out of mind. Hours passed, both Alice and Caesar had sat in the silence of the control room, eyes fixated on the floor as they contemplated the bleak reality of their situation. Somehow, the calm was worse than the storm. A single tear fell from Alice's eye. She was distraught, but lacked the energy or motivation to do anything about it. Caesar, knowing how she enjoyed the calming melody of his father's guitar song during the shuttle ship boarding process, picked up his guitar and again, began to strum those gentle Mexican notes. As our story draws to a close, we are left with the image of Caesar strumming his guitar. Alice's ears noticed the familiarity and the comfort it had brought to everyone waiting at the launch pad. The tiny hairs on her skin stood to attention. Caesar's eyes are closed as he fondly remembers his late father teaching him this tune. It had always brought him comfort in time of heightened stress. Alice's eyes had the opportunity to gaze at him uninterrupted. Maybe, not all hope was lost on the Icarus? The End